Hello, so we're going to pick up where we left off last time uh, answering this big question, will my program run on someone else's computer? This is a question of reproducibility. And so last time we saw that, well, we have to make sure the hardware fits. And that's not so much our concern because the Python interpreter takes care of that for us. Um, what we have to worry about more is the operating system. So we learned about how um, if we're using virtual machines, it's a little bit easier to tell somebody, you must use Ubuntu Linux or whatever I used. Uh, to run my software it makes it kind of more acceptable and not as expensive. Uh, the third thing that we have to worry about matching up to make sure our program runs the same for somebody else are dependencies. And by dependencies, I mean, for example, the things you might import when you're running your program, right? Maybe I import Pandas, maybe I import SQLite. A lot of these uh, dependencies are modules that I'm importing, and those modules are in packages, the packages that I installed with PEP. And so what I really have to worry about is not necessarily that somebody has the exact same uh, packages that I have, but they have the same versions of those packages. All of these things are being updated over time. So let me give you an example here, right? So here I have my simple program.py. I'm importing uh, my uh, pandas module, right? So this program depends on pandas. And one of the coolest things that we can actually do is we can see what version we have. So you can see I'm doing this print here. When I do pandas dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore that's a great debugging thing to do if it you kind of have shared your code with somebody you get the sense that it's running a little bit differently for them right and so how do you get different versions um, well when i do a pip install pandas that's probably going to grab the latest version of the software for me uh, but if i wanted to i could do something else i could say pip install pandas equal equal and then put a specific version number and by doing that i could get different versions of, of, of the software and then so one thing that you might want to think about doing is if you're starting a new project and you want your code to kind of have a long lifespan where it keeps working, is you might want to figure out what the most recent version of the package is, say Pandas, uh, write your code for that version, and then tell anybody who wants to use your code in the future that they still have to use that version that you used, even if um, there are newer versions available, right? That might not be compatible with your code anymore. So you can see that this idea of versioning is really important to reproducibility. So let me motivate a little bit more why we care about different versions. There's actually lots of use cases here and lay down some basic concepts um, in this video. And then the next video, we're actually gonna be looking at a real tool, which is Git. But for now, I'm just gonna kind of keep things general. Um, so versions, uh, we are really kind of about tracking history, right? I mean, there's different versions uh, or kind of checkpoints of some piece of work over time. And I'm guessing most of you have seen this in, in other tools that automatically track history. Um, for example, if you are using Google Documents, um, there's this option to see history, like on the right. And, and you can see a number of things there, right? It'll mark up, maybe crossing off or highlighting what has changed between different versions of the document. Um, you can, on the right, see who is changing it, right? Maybe I'm working with my friends on kind of a team paper. Uh, and different people made different edits, and I kind of want to, when I come back to the document, see what other people have done. And, and, and of course, we can also see when these things have changed. All right, so this is all happening automatically. It's nice, it's easy to use, it happens even if you don't think about it. Um, a more heavyweight alternative is version control systems, which is abbreviated VCS. And these are not happening automatically, but they're doing a lot of the same um, things. And they're kind of uh, useful for larger projects. Um, and that could be anything, right? It could be code is maybe the main example. Um, and these are gonna be useful when we're writing uh, projects that maybe have you know, dozens of different Python files. Um, you could use it for papers, right? Kind of more complicated papers, or you can imagine books might have many files, right? Maybe there's images and other things, um, websites. You could use version control for all of this. And instead of just managing this one document, the version control will have a consistent point of history that looks across all of these different files um, at the same time. And all of these things will be long in something called a repository. For each project, I'm gonna create a repository and put all my files in there and start tracking the history. Okay, so another difference, and, and besides having additional more files, is that I, as the user, decide when I should take a checkpoint at a specific point in time, right? And in and, and the Google documents, it was kind of automatically happening, um, which was easy, but, but there's lots of reasons I might want to do that manually. For example, um, if Google is doing it, maybe they choose a bad point to choose, you know, kind of a snapshot in, in history. Maybe I was in the middle of writing a paragraph and they kind of took a snapshot right in the middle. When we do it manually, I can choose like, okay, this is a good version of the work that isn't somehow, you know, 
semi-complete, right? It kind of makes sense in and of itself, even though I'm going to keep working on it. And, and so in this new language of version control systems, these snapshots or checkpoints are commits. Commit is the word I'm going to be using um, going forward. Um, another difference with these version control systems is that you have to have a little bit of documentation. You have to say what you are doing. Um, before with Google Docs, we could see you know the who, the what, and the when. Um, we're going to get all that with real version control systems, but we'll also be writing some comments like why I made these changes or what the changes were. Um, another uh, difference that kind of gets a little bit hairy is that history is not just the simple sequence of, of versions, right? History can actually uh, branch out and then kind of be merged back together. And so let me just give it a concrete example here. Um, let's say there's two project partners who are working together on um, you know, this homework.py and uh, one of the uh, partners is diligently at school, maybe in a lab working at this. And, and let's say the other one is going on vacation, but still trying to help out from, from the plane. And let's say that this plane uh, does not have uh, Wi-Fi becoming less and less common, but let's say for the sake of argument, no Wi-Fi. And, and so they're both working at this at the same time, but there's no network connect connectivity between them. And they might both make a bunch of changes to the code. And so the big question is here is what will happen when the plane lands, they've kind of branched out and have made different changes. How can we make one uh, good version? Now, it's possible that they were editing completely different parts of the file, and we can automatically kind of reconcile that. These tools can often do that. Uh, but it's also possible there's going to be a conflict. Maybe, uh, maybe um, they were making kind of incompatible changes. Maybe they're editing the same function at the same time, and it doesn't really make sense to kind of combine that code. It's like one version or the other. Um, in those cases, we're gonna actually have to have a human that looks at it and figures out how to merge these uh, kind of conflicts back together. So, so when we have these more complicated tools, we can have this kind of different working environments where maybe not everybody is online um, at the same time. Um, as, as I try to explain these concepts, I'm gonna be drawing a lot of pictures like this. Um, I'm gonna have a, an x-axis, which is time. And then I'm gonna have each of these versions or commits as a, as a gray box. Right, and you can see on the top of the gray boxes, I see what's changing in each version. And then inside, you can see uh, some version of the files. So for example, in the version one, or I may just start saying commit one, um, I have one file, hello.py, and that prints something, it prints hi. Um, in the next version, I made some changes to that file. I, I print hello and world. Um, and in the third version, I not only make changes to that file, but I add this new module. Right? So, and you can see why it's important here that I have some sort of consistent view across multiple files, right? It doesn't make sense for um, hello.py to call a, a method, or I'm sorry, a function in dog.py unless you know, I also have that same version of dog.py, right? So the version control system is going to keep track of all of these uh, different versions, and it's going to let us switch between them. But when you're actually kind of working in the code at any given point in time, you're just going to see like one version that you're working on, right? So normally you can kind of forget about these all these old, older versions unless you want to, say, go back to them or kind of do some other things. Okay, so there's three use cases I want to talk about for why we want to keep track of this history. And one has to do with uh, blaming people for bugs, which is maybe not as mean as it sounds. So um, here, uh, instead of just drawing all these files, I'm going to draw both light bulbs and bugs. Uh, the light bulbs represent features in the software, good stuff, which changes and evolves over time, and then the bugs represent, well, you know what bugs are. Um, so this first version of this code, um, here's me, Tyler. Uh, I, you can see there's a candle there, so kind of a basic, maybe prototype kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and I want to improve that, so maybe I made some uh, changes to the code, and, and kind of that improvement is represented by going from a candle to an actual light bulb. And, and of course, whenever you're adding fancy new features, there's more opportunities to write bugs. So let's say I actually introduced a bug there, but uh, you know it wasn't a very obvious bug. And uh, for most cases where you run the program, you don't see it. Maybe only for very particular CSV files when I kind of feed those into my program does this show up. So there's a bug, but nobody knows about it. It's just kind of hiding there. Um, now, now let's say after that, somebody else comes along and makes even more improvements and they don't get rid of any bugs and don't introduce any new bugs. And so that's uh, Sri Shruti. Let's say she did that. And, um, and let's say after she did that, somebody finally notices that, oh, hey, there's a bug in this software. And, and so they kind of look back at the history and who are they gonna blame? Are they gonna blame me or Sri Shruti? 
um, the inclination will be, be to blame Sri Shruti. It's like, well, you just changed the code and now it's not working for me. Uh, but we actually know that that's not right. I was the one who introduced Bog, Tyler, right? And so how can we figure this out? Well, if we have all these versions of history, what we can do is we can write, you know, maybe some sort of test.py and add some new test cases in there that actually kind of exercise this bug that when you run the test, um, they, they, it'll you know, crash because that bug is there. And so what we could do is we could go back and we could run that um, new tester on all of these three versions we have. And that's gonna be very informative because we'll see, well, uh, it worked fine in version one, but the problem actually started in version two. And, and, then, and then, so we're kind of blaming version two, not to be mean, but to, well, tell me, Tyler, hey, you're the one who should probably fix this because you introduced it. You know, everybody makes bugs, but this one's your job to fix. Um, and also kind of narrowing it down, it's like, well, I didn't have the bug in commit one, I had the bug in commit two. So I can look at exactly what I changed there and that's trying to help me quickly um, figure out how to fix it. So that's a first use case, right? We can kind of debug more effectively, especially when we have these kind of tricky bugs that um, we don't really discover until you know a long time passes, right? And I, I've had bugs, right, where it was there for over a year before anybody noticed. A bunch of people were using it, but it, it just didn't show up. Okay, and then finally I fixed this. I have my new version that makes everything good again. Um, another thing that we're going to want to do uh when we have this long history uh, there might be trade-offs between different commits right that somebody might want to do so so here i'm kind of showing that uh you know i have the candles at first and I make it a little bit better and then in version three i both fix a bug and i make a, a kind of a fundamental switch to how it works i have maybe something more efficient like a light bulb and um and then kind of over time i'm adding more features and uh and then you know possibly reducing some bugs and then uh, by by uh, version eight or commit eight, I've kind of gotten rid of some white bugs. So the question here is here, uh, which one of these would I want to use if I was a user of of this software? And and I think there are some multiple uh, right answers. Uh, maybe one right answer is that I want version eight because um, you know it has the most features and and there's only one bug. Um, there's some bad answers, right? Like maybe. Um, Nobody should ever use uh, version seven, right? Because version seven is just plain, plain and simple. It's worse than version eight. Um, a reasonable person might want to use version three, right? Version three is the latest version uh, that doesn't have any any bugs. And so, well, what are you going to use? Do you want to use version three or version eight? I mean, that might depend some on your personality, right? Maybe you really hate bugs, uh, but more often it's going to depend on what you're doing. Um, if I'm making a video game. Uh, maybe it's more important that I have more features and some bugs are okay, right? A video game is not high stakes. Um, if I'm in you know, banking or maybe I'm writing medical software, uh, then version three probably is pretty appealing, right? And in kind of these high stakes environments, it's very important to have uh, no bugs, right? Even, even if it means that I don't have as many features. Um, so what we'll do, right, um, typically over time on a software project that's under active development is you have all these people who are working on it and kind of making changes and you have all this history. And uh, there's the development team who is kind of, you know, understands the code, understands bugs, and they might always be on the latest version. But there's people who are not on the team who uh, want to choose, well, what version of the software should they do? And so these developers or these outsiders will go through and say, well, maybe this is a good commit you might want to use, that's version one. You know, I may say that commit three is version two, commit four is version 2.1, then maybe I get all the way up to um, version uh, eight and that's 2.2. And then I'll tell an outsider, I'm like, hey, unless you're actually programming on this project, if you just want to use it, you know, choose one of these four, right? It doesn't make sense for you to ever use um, a version seven, right? And so uh, in version control systems, there's often this ability to like tag specific commits and that's how you release a version of, of, of your software, right? That takes time to figure out which ones are the are the right ones. Uh, let me show you an example of a real project. Um, Pandas, right, my kind of go-to example. And so I'm gonna click this link down here. Uh, this is on IPy, right? You can see, if I pronounce this up here, PyPy. Um, when I'm uh, installing packages with pip, it's installing things from PyPy. And you can see that this is a Pandas project. And you can see that there's all these different versions, right? Uh, you know, I think when I uh, first started teaching, we weren't even to version one yet, right? Now we've kind of stabilized one version. Uh, the latest version is what? 
about 1.1 was released on, on July the 28th, right? So any of these versions would be kind of reasonable for me um, to use. But in between these versions, the developers of this package um, we're making lots of different changes. And, and I can do that if I head over here and I click on source code, um, that's gonna show me on this site GitHub, which we're gonna be talking more about, about all the history that's been going on with those projects. So um, a few things that I can see, well, first off, let's scroll down here a little bit. Um, we can see contributors. These contributors are people who have actually been making changes uh, to the code and there's over 2000, right? So you can see the great complexity here. Um, and the need for these kind of tools to track who is doing uh, what. It's a huge project, right? So I have all these people. And across all of them, they have made 24,000 commits, right? So there have been really 24,000 different versions of, of the software uh, that we can see. And, um, and each of them has, uh, you can see over here on the right, this is a commit number. And, uh, and we're gonna talk more later why those numbers look so weird. Right? It's not, I've been kind of doing nice numbers like one, two, three, four. Uh, these actual commit numbers are kind of weird. Um, other thing I can see here, right, is that uh, I can see who did it, right? I can see the names of these people. I can see when they did it. Um, and then I can see these comments up here, like what were they trying to do? Avoid post-processing in blockwise op. I have no idea what that means because I'm not part of this project. Um, and then the last interesting thing here, right, is you can see I maybe make this a little bit larger. You can see some of these have um, an X by them, a red X, and then other ones have uh, this green green check. And what this means is, is this version of the code um, passing um, all the tests, right? And so what I could see right away is that if I was trying to create a release for um, other people to use Pandas, um, I would never have them use this latest version, right? Because this latest version has bugs in it. This version of Pandas has bugs in it, right? So I would never tag that for release. Okay, so of those 24,000 commits, if I scroll down here, I can see that there's only 119 uh, releases, right, that have kind of been tagged. And these are the ones that outsiders would actually actually do. Um, okay, so I'm gonna head back here to the slides. Um, so I was trying to have a sense of a real project and what people are doing here. And that's a second use case, right? I wanna have these version releases. Um, on that note, uh, something that I can actually do is I can actually branch off in history. So, so let's say we were going along in time and we got to version four and uh, maybe the team has a debate now. Um, some people feel like, hey, maybe there's a bug there. We haven't quite pinpointed it yet, but it would be good to fix that bug. And maybe the other people are like, well, the bugs aren't that bad. It would be great to add some new features. What we can actually do is we can kind of split off, right? One person goes along adding new features and maybe somebody else says, um, I want to uh, kind of work on removing that bug, right? So maybe instead of having just, you know, one uh, commit number five, I might have, you know, a 5A and a 5B. Um, they're kind of working on different things. And, and so what I'll often do then is I'll be tagging those versions that are just kind of clean up. So, so kind of the way this process might work is I have all this history, I choose some good starting commits, and then maybe some of them I clean them up a little bit, and then I actually kind of create these nice releases that other people uh, might use. Because that's one use of branching, right? Where one commit, instead of having like a next version, it might have two next versions. Okay, so there's another use case for this branching feature, um, and, and that is for uh, giving feedback, right? So, so kind of the scenario I'm imagining here is that you have a team of you know senior developers and they've been working on this project, and uh, they're very good, and they get this intern um, who uh, maybe writes some buggy code. I mean, they're still kind of getting used to it, right? And, um, and they have an intern project. And so maybe what you want to have them do instead of uh, writing all their code directly on this main chain of history is they might create off on a separate branch and kind of over their summer uh, make their changes. And maybe they have the feature and a bug and eventually they clean up the bug. And what they'll eventually do is they'll say, hey, I, I made some stuff on my private chain of history. Um, can I merge that back into uh, the main branch, and, and I guess like currently in a lot of tools that's called the master branch. I have a reading about uh, that terminology. Eventually that'll be called the main branch. But they'll say, hey, can I merge this back to the main or the master branch? And at that point, um, one of these senior developers might read their code and give feedback on it and uh, and then have to decide, well, whether or not they can pull it back in. And they might ask them to make other changes first before uh, they pull that back into the into the main into the main branch. And, and so this is a very common practice. This is called peer review. 
uh, or code review. And, um, you know, I was kind of setting it up as like the intern making a mistake, but really, you know, uh, everybody will do this like in a big software company at Microsoft, you know, you could be however senior and somebody's gonna have to review your code before it gets in because everybody makes mistakes, right? Those are the three cases. Um, in the next video, we're actually gonna learn about how to use uh, get and kind of actually run some commands.